appreciate you being here. I'm very, very pleased to welcome today Dave Nasser, who will be speaking um, about his grassroots faith-based organization, Tent of Nations, which promotes peace and reconciliation for people of all faiths um, and welcomes people from all around the world, but focuses on reconciling Israelis and Palestinians. Um, it's Palestinian Christian, so it's it's based on certain precepts of faith, but again, it's open to all different faiths, calls upon Jews, calls upon Muslims and Christians. Um, and we're very proud to have him here today. Um, introducing him a little bit more or giving some more idea will be Kay, who's from Friends of Tens of Nations, um, and we'll be talking about uh, some of the books that highlight some of Dalib's new work as well as some other things. And so I'll pass the floor over to her. But I just want everyone to give a round a warm round of applause to Dalib. <laughs> you could all move closer if you really wanted to come down. <laughs> I won't have a mic. I know you can hear me though. <clears throat> we have spoken to groups from 200 to 20. So you fall within that range. <laughs> And the people who are not here are missing out on a message that's very important. I'm sorry that they're not here. But um, I just kind of start out with a little bit of history for our involvement with this issue. And uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we had friends, a couple that went to visit the Holy Land, uh, deep, deeply faithful people, um, very open-minded people. And uh, we had dinner with a group when they came back, and I was talking to Marilyn. And she talked about what they had found and seen there, and uh, the plight of the Palestinians. And at that point, I thought, oh, this sounds very weird. That's not what I see in the media. I don't know what she's talking about. Although I trusted her, but it just didn't make sense to me. So on the way home, I looked to my husband, and I said, you know, Marilyn was talking, and she sounded very anti-Semitic in my, my stupidity, my ignorance, my uneducated experience. That was certainly not what she was saying or being or acting as. And so my vision of Palestinians at that time was what we'd seen in the paper. The black masked masses of young men marching through the streets with their rifles raised and chanting death to Israel, death to America. And that was all Palestinians as far as I was concerned. And anybody who'd seen it, that was all they could see, the only image they would get from this. Well, I never gave it another thought after that dinner. So several years later, uh, we didn't know this gentleman at the time, but in uh, June of 06, an American Palestinian Jew, is how he described himself, named Mark Braverman, PhD in clinical psychology, well-read, bright, he'd worked on kibbutzes, he'd traveled back and forth to the land, he had family there, his grandfather, his father. Uh, he happened to be born and raised in Philly in a Jewish neighborhood, and they celebrated the establishment of the Israeli state, never thinking that it might be another side to the story called the Nakba, or the catastrophe from the Palestinian side. So he said, I knew there was another side intellectually, but emotionally I did not want to go there. I closed the door to any other side other than the Israeli and the Jewish side. So he eventually said, I, I need to go there. So he, he signed up with a group called Interfaith Peace Builders. I have a couple of flyers. If you as students especially are interested in going on a tour, this is a really great tour to go with. So IFPB, and it is truly interfaith in terms of the people that go. They've done, been doing this for over 20 years. And they go four or five times a year with a group. And he said, I went with them, and they visit refugee camps. They visit uh, uh, the holy sites. They visit uh, the farm, Tent of Nations. They visit peace groups, Israeli-led and Palestinian-led peace groups. They saw the whole shmir. And... He came back and he was like a 180 degree turn from what he'd started out with. Changed person. He said, you cannot go and see this without coming back completely changed in your attitude and your point of view. Sympathetic, always sympathetic to the Israeli point of view because there is a great deal to be sympathetic over. I was always affected by the tears over the suicide bombers who would take the buses and the cafes and the other uh, transportation or just out on the street and it's just blowing people to bits. It was a terrible thing that Hamas was doing. No one can favor that kind of action to reaction. You might understand eventually why they did it, because Hamas was created by the action and reaction to the Palestinians by the Israelis and how they, they came to take over the land, but you can't accept it as a, as a way to, to solve the problem. <clears throat> so 
My husband then was invited to go and hear Mark Braverman speak in October of 06 at the New York Presbyterian Church, big church in DC. And this was just all kind of faded, I think, incidental, but faded. Uh, someone said, hey, you need to go hear this man talk. He's talking about peace. And Bill said, okay, I'm free that afternoon. So he went in, heard Mark Braverman give his presentation, came back to our house and said, I've got to go. And I said, where? He said, Israel, Palestine. I said, who have you been talking to? And he said, Mark Braverman. He explained what was happening. And I said, okay, what are we going to do? And he said, well, there's an interfaith peace builders group going in November, two weeks from now. There's one spot open. I think that's for me. And I said, <laughs> he did, he went, he came back. He was a history teacher. He's a comparative religions teacher in high school. And he came back and said, you know, I've talked about this, I've talked about it, but I've never seen it. Oh my God, this cannot continue. Mark Braverman would say to you, you cannot be doing what you're doing in the name of my religion or my name. And he almost went away from and just declared, I'm not a Jew anymore. I'm going to leave it. I can't live with this. Uh, he eventually changed his mind and became proud to be a Jew because he knew so many other people that were working on this human rights. It's basically human rights for everyone. And in the process, we watched him age about 10 years in two years, <laughs> staying up obsessed with writing this book, just obsessed with getting this book out. It's called Fatal Embrace, and it's a wonderful study group uh, book to use. He's got a study guide out with it too, to use in, in universities or colleges or uh, co uh, churches, synagogues, mosques, anywhere. It's a great resource book. And in a nutshell, what he says is, I give you permission as an American Jewish Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Jew to chastise the Israeli government for the tactics they use against another people. And do it without feeling guilty because it's the best thing you can do for them. You will help them save their soul if they do not continue or can stop doing what they're doing to the Palestinian people. So that's that. There's a much easier read that you can read one letter at a time. Another American uh, Jew who went, traveled, came back and said, not in my name. And so he began to compile letters from Palestine. It's a wonderful compilation of letters from Palestinians, where they're living today, their personal experience, what they've seen, what, how this has affected their lives, and they and become really close to you. They become your friends through the, reading this book. Daoud's story is one of those that's in here, so you can read it again. But professors, or just as individuals, whatever, if you can get these books into your classrooms or whatever, they're really good resources. Very different approach, same message. <clears throat> now, for a year, uh, my husband Bill, who traveled with Bill Mims, that he met on this trip, who lives like five minutes from our house, 20 minutes from our house in Vienna. For a year, they uh, formed a trio, Bill, Bill, and Mark, trying to figure out how they can get this message out. How can they support the, this, the programs on Tenth Nations? So Mark says, let's form a 501c3 nonprofit. We said, sure, how do we do that? He says, I know how. Fill out the forms, easy, get the thing. OK, we formed a 501c3, Friends of Tenth Nations North America, FOTANA. and. Uh, Sponsor two fundraising educational t tours a year for Dawood for like three and a half years. We've had, this is I think the seventh one. And we try to educate people of, about the issues that are on the land and uh, form this organization. And it's just been for me a life changing experience, although I've never been there. My husband said, do you want to be the director of finance? I said, sure, I can do that. That's easy. Whoa, little did I know what that was going to entail. Uh, but it's a labor of love, and people say, why do you do this? And I say, two reasons. Number one, I cannot create peace in the Middle East. I don't have the power, the authority, the position to do that. But by gum, I can do everything in my power to save this 100-acre farm in the West Bank Area C, and I will spend the rest of my life doing that if I have to. I hope it's no longer three years maybe we'll solve this problem, right? But that's one reason. The other reason is I look at this man and his wife and their children and his mother and his brothers, and I say they have a choice. They've been offered millions of dollars for this 100-acre farm. They can move anywhere in the world that they want to move to. They're bright, well-educated. Their children are bright. They could go anywhere. But they have made the choice to stay and fight the good fight. They're not giving up until they absolutely have to, and we hope they don't have to. 
but the choice is theirs and they've chosen to stay. That's a very powerful message to you all. Daoud. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be here and talk to you at this university. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, my name is Dawood. Dawood is David, and I was born in Bethlehem in, uh, uh, in 1970 and grew up there and then left uh, to study in, in Austria. So I have a degree in biblical studies, came back uh, to Bethlehem in 1991, where I studied uh, a business with major accounting, and I continued my studies with tourism management in Germany. And it was like, for me, very important to, uh, to work in the field of tourism because Many, uh, many foreigners coming to visit the Holy Land, but most of them, they are not spending much time in the country itself. They just run from, uh, from one church to another, from one place to another, and at the end, they have no uh, meeting with the local uh, people. We are talking about Israelis and Palestinians and Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Now, um, I'm working since uh, 2001, actually 2000 with the project uh, called the Tent of Nations. And the idea of this project is to bring people from different cultures, na nations, and, uh, and countries together to build bridges of understanding of reconciliation and peace. Of course, we are living there in a situation where uh, there is conflict, where there are problems, negatives. You hear always the negative sides of this uh, story. But for us also, it's very important to keep the positives and to think in a positive way. That's why uh, we started this project. Even we are facing a very difficult situation regarding the land that, we, that I'll be talking about, which is totally connected with the project we are doing now. And the land uh, I'm talking about is, uh, belong, belong to my, belongs to my family that was bought in 1916. Of course, you know, Palestine... Um, and the, the, the Palestinian territories now are under the Israeli occupation, the West Bank and Gaza, and we are located southwest of Bethlehem on a nice hill, which is uh, about uh, 3,000 feet above sea level, and from there, um, you, you know, people have um, a nice view to the west, and sometimes you could see the Mediterranean from there. Of course, the situation after 1967 was changing, because... In, in, the, uh, in the occupied territories, Israel started to build settlements there on Palestinian land. And now we find ourselves there on the farm, surrounded by Israeli settlements from all sides, five Israeli settlements. And those settlements are taking the land and the resources from the Palestinians. Of course, the, uh, beside the, the, the land, there is also a Palestinian village, which is called uh, Nahalin. Now... In 1916, during the Ottoman period, my grandfather registered the land. So we have papers from the Ottoman period, uh, from the English Mandat period, from the Jordanians, and even from Israel after 1967. And we have also papers that, we, that, that proves we, um, we paid taxes at that time. But of course, you know, during the Ottoman period, many Palestinians, they did not register their land, so they don't have documents for their land. But in our case, this is this what makes our case stronger, is that we have the papers for that. And uh, as you see here, this is the old family picture of my grandfather and his family, who, when he bought the land, he moved with his wife, my grandmother, and three sons to the land, and they used to live in a cave on the property. For my grandfather, it was very important for him to, to create a new existence, to work the land, and to teach his children to love their, their land. And after he passed away, my father and uncle continued the work he started. They farmed the land, and they lived there in caves until they passed away. My father died in 1976, and my uncle died in 1987. So I'm telling this personal story because this also, my story is also affected by the political situation there we are facing until now. Now, in, uh, in 1991, we heard by chance that the Israelis declared our farm as a state land. And this is here on the hill. This is our land, which is about 100 acres, located on a hill. And of course, you know, for the Israelis, it's a good place to build a new settlement. In 2001, they started, they blocked the, the road, the access road to our farm. 
So uh, now we have difficulties until today to cross from and to our farm. Uh, but in 1991, when they declared it as a state land, we are the only family who went to the court at that time because we have the papers. So we started the legal battle uh, in, in, in front of the Israeli um, courts, 12 years legal battle in front of the military court, and more than seven years in front of the Supreme Court. Of course, uh, always they need more papers, they need uh, more land, uh, survey for the land, and... Um, we have been struggling in the Israeli courts until today. So the, the whole issue, the whole process cost us so far $140,000. Even we have the papers that proves that we are the owners of the land. But because of our location, they wanted to make it difficult for us to prove ownership. On the ground, besides the legal battle, we, we had a lot of attacks from the Israeli settlers were living in the different settlements beside the land, and they started attacking us, coming to visit the land with, with guns. And uh, the idea is like to put uh, physical pressure beside the, uh, the legal battle, to put a physical pressure on us in order to give up and leave. So they came and uprooted trees, they damaged our water tank, they threatened us with guns, and they tried to build three times a road on our property in order to establish a settlement. And we managed to stop that road by court three times. And the last time they came in 2002 with big machines and they started working um, three days there. But we managed to stop that road by court. And the Israeli settlers were very angry and they uprooted 250 olive trees from our property. Of course, you know, uprooting an olive tree is, uh, that means like you are uprooting hope for a better future. We were very frustrated. Uh, we were down. But we received an email from a Jewish organization located in England called European Jews for Just Peace in Palestine. And they heard about us and they sponsored the land with 250 olive trees. And they came and planted those trees you know, by themselves. The idea is like we, we uh, it was like a big empowerment for us to feel that we are not alone in this struggle. Many people abroad or in the country itself, they are uh, believing in peace and justice. Now, in today's situation, we are still facing difficulties with land, with the roadblocks. It's not so easy to cross to the farm. Of course, like those roadblocks are um, in order to prevent many Palestinians from crossing to their land, because when there, is, there was a law during the Ottoman period, if the land is kept abandoned, not cultivated for more than five to ten years, the state has the right to declare it as a state land. That means if many Palestinians could not work on their land and they are taking aerial photographs, they can prove that the land was not cultivated continuously, so they could declare it as a state land, then it's being confiscated for building Israeli settlements. Now, the, the biggest obstacle we are facing now is also the wall that Israel is building. The wall is not built on at the borders between the West Bank and Israel. Of course, I am I am a man that does not believe in walls. You know, in order to have peace, we need to build bridges. We have to to bring people together, not walls that separate people from each other. Because with those walls, we we create more more enemies. We create more hatred. We create more uh, bitterness. So that's why it's very important for us to focus on that. But the reality is totally different. And the wall, as I said before, is not built on at the borders, but it is going deep into the Palestinian territories and separating Palestinians from Palestinians and Palestinians from their own land. There, uh, they built, the Israelis built also a network of, uh, of streets for us that are extra to be used by the Palestinians, uh, independently of the Israeli streets. For example, here we have this wall and above is a settlement, is a settler's road. We are not allowed to drive on this road, but our access road is here. And the idea is like to, to keep us under control so that uh, this road will be totally under Israeli control. That means if I want to cross as a Palestinian from one place to another, I have to face checkpoints. And the trip that might uh, normally t take like an hour or, or let us say half an hour, it might take three, four hours waiting at the checkpoint for nothing. It's, uh, it's uh, for us um, putting more pressure on the Palestinians and on the people themselves 
to, uh, to feel that uh, they cannot achieve anything there, uh, whether they have to react in a violent way or leave the area. This is also um, another picture of the wall that you see here separating the Palestinian village from their, from their land. And we are, when we are talking about a wall, we are talking about, um, um, about uh, nine meters high wall, which is about, it, yeah, uh, about uh, this long. And um, it is very difficult to live behind uh, walls. And it's very difficult because many people, they, they especially ch young children now, they are growing up with this difficult situation. They don't know much about their land. And of course, the land that um, the other side is also, like, it's an enemy. <clears throat> now, um, this is a map of the, of the wall in our area. This is here the green line. I can maybe point it from here. The borders between the West Bank and <clears throat> Israel, excuse me. And uh, we have, this is the, the root of the wall here in our area. I'm sorry. We are located here in the middle. And as you see here, the, the, the red, the, the blue colors and the, the, uh, uh, the dark blue is actually Israeli settlements in our area. And we have uh, five villages in our area. And we are located here between a Palestinian village and an Israeli settlement. Now, uh, closing this area, that means for many Palestinians who are living in Bethlehem area, they cannot cross uh, any time to their land. So they have to cross only through the tunnel that uh, is being built for us. And this will make it very difficult for the Palestinians to farm their land. And with the time, they are losing their own property. Now, for the people who are living in this enclave, I can, I can say, is uh, it also the situation for, for them is, is being also very, is becoming more difficult because most of the people are depending on the city of Bethlehem, for example, to cross from one place to another. And that's why many Palestinians will, will uh, decide to leave the area uh, with, with the time because at the end they feel they cannot achieve anything there and they are not, they, they, we, have, we don't have enough uh, schools there, we don't have an, an, um, a hospital there, we don't have the infrastructure. So many people will be forced to leave the area. So when the people are leaving their land, the Israelis will declare it as a state land, and then, then they can take it uh, for the expansion of the Israeli settlements. Now, um, here, the, the new plan, this is recently, the new plan is also, we are located here, and the new plan is actually to, to build roads that will disconnect us even from the villages and from the city, so that we will be existing as an island project on the land. And with the time, the, the issue is that, oh, thank you so much, we will, uh, we will, will give up and, and leave the area. Of course, this situation is bringing many Palestinians, whether to react in a violent way, resign and give up and leave. You know. For us, from the beginning, we said we will never act in a violent way. We are people who believe in justice. We are not passive people. We want to do things. We want to, to do whatever we can within our possibilities. And that's why we, we said also we are not giving up as Kay said and leave the country. No, we want to achieve something positive there. And we said uh, we, we are trying to deliver a message which is we refuse to be enemies. So we are not acting violently. We are not... Um, uh, being passive people, and we will, be, we will not leave the area. So we created a fourth option, which is we refuse to be enemies. It's very, it's not uh, an easy thing to say. It. Uh, it's not an easy sentence to say we refuse to be enemies. But for us, we want to move out of this circle of, of, uh, of hatred. You know, we want to break the chain and start acting and acting differently and acting in a positive way. Thank you so much. That's good. <laughs> And uh, because living in a situation where people are separated from each other, Israelis and Palestinians, the easiest way to think is in a negative way, and to think about the other is, an, is as an enemy. But for us, living under this difficult situation, we wanted to, to, uh, to uh, create a nonviolent way of action, 
which is we refuse to be enemies. And under this slogan, we created the Tent of Nations. We wanted to resist and overcome the evil, not with evil, but with good. And this is also our, our message of nonviolent action. So under this slogan, we created the Tent of Nations. And the idea for the Tent of Nations on our farm is to open the farm, to bring people there from Israelis and Palestinians, internationals together, and try to learn from each other. Learn, learning by doing. Come and see and learn. And uh, the idea also to build a bridge between people and people, but also between people and their land. Because land is a, a very important issue in our struggle. Without land, we will not have, have, uh, have a future there. So that's why it's for us very important to connect both together. But the idea is also um, to channel our frustration constructively. Because our pain is a, is, a, uh, is a power that might come out in a negative way and might hurt people. But we want to, to channel this, this power into to be constructive and not destructive. And this is the, the idea of the Tent of Nations. So we said we are people who believe in justice and we want to continue the legal battle. So we started the, the legal battle in 1991 and it is going until today. You know? So uh, over almost 20 years. But we believe in, in justice and we, we, we think that one day the sun of justice will rise again, sooner or later. At the same time, we started to do something. It's not like just to hope for something, but we need to be active and start doing there. Uh, so we started cultivating more land uh, since 2001, uh, actually uh, since 1991, but later on mostly more in 2001. And the idea is like to cultivate more land because if the land is not cultivated, is not planted by trees, the Israelis will declare it as a state land and they will take it for the expansion of the Israeli settlements. So we are planting more trees every year. And of course, uh, we are trying to, um, to um, solve the problems that we are facing, especially with water and electricity. So we are in an area which is called now sea area. It is totally controlled by the Israelis. And on my own land, as a Palestinian, I'm not allowed to have running water, no electricity, and I will not get a building permit. So how can I develop my land without water, without electricity, and without uh, building permit, but of course we don't want to stay and be as victims and to act as victims. We want to, you know, to move out of this uh, circle of, uh, you know, uh, being a victim, and we wanted to act, but acting differently. So that's why we said, since we are not allowed to have running uh, to, uh, running water, let us build our own systems. So we are we build systems. We are collecting rainwater. Uh, we are depending totally on rainwater. And uh, for, uh, for electricity, we said uh, we have a diesel generator sponsored by our friends of Tent of Nations in North America. But last year, with the help, with the support of a German organization, we, um, we installed a solar power system for 4.5 kilowatt of electricity. And this is the, the, f the first one in our area there. And the idea is not just to get power there, but the, the issue is to show people that things are possible, and even the situation is very hard, why, why not to focus on the, on the positive things? If I want to start thinking about my problems, the limitations, the difficulties we are facing every day, we will never be able to do anything. So why not to, loo, to, to leave some room uh, for hope, to keep this hope alive? And at the, at the end, you will feel the results. You will see that things are moving forward, even it's very difficult. Of course, uh, last May, we received nine demolishing orders for nine structures we built without a permit on our own land. And this roof is considered to be illegal. So this roof is, is under threat to be demolished. Uh, also, we, uh, we have the tents. We have three big tents that are, they are also uh, threatened to be demolished because those tents were built without a permit. Even a tent I need for, for a tent, I need a permit on my own land. But we, we wanted to overcome the obstacle of buildings. We said, since we are not allowed to build on the ground, let us build under the ground. Let us renovate caves. So we re renovated uh, different caves, seven caves we have. And among them is actually uh, a, um, um, a small chapel 
So we have people coming and, and do prayers there. And we started also renovating some natural caves to be used for our summer activities. And uh, for example, this, this cave was uh, we, where we put the horses, and now we have a meeting room there. And uh, those children, we have the summer camp activities, and those children did this, those paintings. They painted their shadows. And uh, under the slogan, um, peace, justice, and uh, 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 conservation of the creation. So those also mosaic were done by children during the summer camp. Uh, we do summer camp activities with children, and we focus on recycling and also about environmental issues uh, because we need our children to, to n- not to, to think in a negative way, you know, they, they, they are able to shape their future, and that's why, that's why it's very important for us <clears throat> to teach our children this way. Where they, the, the broken tiles are collected from the garbage, and we do with the children this kind of stuff in order to show them, even with limited resources, you can do something positive. You know. So uh, we have the three big tents that accommodate our volunteers and... Um, and uh, guests, and as I said before, those tents are threatened to be demolished. Then the third issue we started with is the uh, learning hope and planting peace, and we started inviting groups, uh, internationals, locals, Palestinians, and Israelis to come to our farm and learn about our situation, and learn that there is still hope for, uh, for peace, for, for justice, and uh, we do every year a tree planting campaign. And uh, the idea of the tree planting is to invite internationals, locals, and Palestinians and Israelis to plant for peace. The idea is doing something positive, doing something to protect the environment, to protect the land, to make it green and productive, but also to learn together through face-to-face encounter that, um, that peace should grow from the grassroots. Peace cannot imposed on us from, the, from, the up, from up to down. It should be practiced on the ground. We need to find, to, to, you know, to create a foundation, a good ground for peace. And this is actually what we are trying to do, exactly as when you plant an olive tree. And planting an olive tree, you need, you need um, uh, to water it at least the first two years. And it is uh, hard work for us and our volunteers because we, we go from one tree to another to to give it uh, twice a week a small cup of water just to keep the humidity. But at, at the end, they, the tree will, will have the chance to, uh, the roots will, will have the chance to, um, to go deep into the earth and then the tree can live for generations. This is actually how we are trying to achieve peace, you know, uh, grassroots work. We have different kinds of groups who are coming to plant trees there. And uh, as I mentioned before, we have the summer camp activities. We invite uh, Palestinian children from Bethlehem area, both Christians and Muslims. And the idea is to bring them together and uh, to connect them with land. So we try to do environmental activities. We focus on uh, on, uh, painting on stones, painting on rocks, mosaic, you know, uh, music, art, and at the end of the camp, we invite the parents for, uh, for a festival. And the idea is to encourage the parents through their children. Of course, you know, we are working with children who are traumatized, who are living in a very difficult situation. And every time when you talk about uh, their situation, when, they, when you ask them about their situation, they started to, say, to speak about their bad experiences, stories, how um, a neighbor was, was uh, arrested how uh, the father was killed, all those stories. And I'm sure that there are so many stories from the other side. And that's why it's very important for us to start working with the new generation to help them, to support them, to show them that they are able to do it differently in a positive way. And that's why we need to invest in them because they are the future of the country. We um, do different kinds of activities with them. And the idea is to strengthen them, you know, to, to, to give them the possibility to think in a, in a positive way. And we have so many examples working with children. They came very um, you know, frustrated and they went back home motivated again. 
We have different kinds of work camps that are running uh, throughout the year. We have the, the, um, the almond harvest, the grape harvest, the olive harvest, and always with those kinds of activities, we try to bring people together. We try to bring them to the farm, live there in a community, work together, but also learn from each other. And this is how we can build bridges, bridges of understanding, of reconciliation and peace. We have different kinds of activities, uh, especially with international youth programs. And the idea is to bring young people to the country, to bring them in touch with, uh, with another young people, but also um, to build bridges between nations. And we are trying also to bring young people outside the country in order to do something like a project there. Because many people, they think, okay, m uh, visitors are coming to, to, to Palestine in order to know or to learn how difficult life is. That's true. But also it will, uh, it will frustrate us because we, we stay in this victim mentality. We talk, we talk about the negatives that we are facing, the problems we are having. But at the end, it's, it's important for our young people to move out and try to help others. You know? And it's like mutual support from both sides. Uh, we have also daily activities with children, working with, um, with school kids. And uh, very, I hope uh, next year in February to start a project with young children um, in their six years old. And the idea is to bring them 15 to 20 to the farm and plant trees and try to work with them the whole year. Those kinds of activities are not um, within the schools. So I would like to work with them as a pilot project for uh, one year, two Fridays every month. And the idea is to see if, you know, if they learn, if they are learning something, you know. Small kids, because we need, we need the, our young generation to be, to be motivated, you know. When you talk to the young people, they, 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 they see everything is dark. They have no future, you know. But we want to show the people that there is, we have still light in this dark tunnel. And we need to follow the light in order to bring ourselves out of this very dark tunnel. We have volunteers coming to visit. Uh, we have volunteers uh, coming and spending 13 months, especially Germans. They are doing it as part of their civil service activity. And we have other volunteers coming for a short and long-term period until three months. And they help with the infrastructure there. They help with agriculture. And also we have volunteers who are coming to help with the summer camp activities, especially with the children summer camp. So they come for two weeks and uh, help uh, uh, giving creative workshops for the children. On our farm, we have also um, uh, something like a peace circle because our farm is... Uh, for, with its location is open for, for Israelis and Palestinians to come together. And uh, we, we do like those kinds of activities uh, that bring people together. So we have um, Palestinians, Israelis, internationals on the farm to come and, and know each other as people. You know? It's not about like bringing people together, especially Israelis and Palestinians, where they hug each other and say we are living in peace. No, because it's not the reality. We, we can, you cannot talk about peace while you are living under occupation. But the idea is we want to, uh, to, to teach the Israelis how we are living as Palestinians. We want them to understand that we are also people. We would like to live. We, we have hopes for the future. We want the best for our children, exactly as any family. And that's why the, the best thing to do it is to build bridges, is to bring people into face-to-face -face encounter. And one time we had a big gathering and one Israeli lady, uh, she told me, she asked me if she could invite an Israeli friend who was in the settlement. And for us, it was very difficult because we had the bad experience from the settlers. But this lady from the settlement was there. Yeah, and I was telling the group about our situation and I mentioned that we have no drinking water here. This woman interrupted me and, she, and I thought, we will, not, we will have a very uh, hard discussion. And, I, I, and I, uh, she said, well, you have no running water here, but we, we have swimming pools in our settlements. You know? And she added, I'm living there since nine years, and for the first time I realized that I have neighbors. You know? So people, when they start to meet the other as a human being, they will start you know, to think differently. 
And this is actually the way that we are trying to achieve as, uh, as project there. This woman came back with her husband, and one day before the, uh, the New Year um, celebrations, as, I mean, the, the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, she came all the way walking down from the settlement to wish us Happy New Year. I don't, this is the foundation for peace. You know? It's not peace, but this is the, we are on the right way to achieve the real peace. We have also a women project in the village, uh, close to the farm. And uh, my wife started this project a couple of years back. And the idea is to, uh, to open up an opportunity for women to come out of their houses and try to learn something. And we focus on English classes, uh, uh, computer classes, and we are adding this year uh, farming skills. And the idea is not only about education, it's about motivation, motivating the people to stay where they are, you know, to be connected with land. And uh, this is my wife, Jihan. Uh, she, uh, she's, uh, she studied uh, computer in Ohio. And she is depending on uh, international volunteers to help her with. You know. so, so many volunteers are coming to work in teaching computer, English, other, uh, other issues. We had uh, workshops about first aid, uh, about accounting, marketing. Etc. And the idea again is to build bridges between nations and and cultures. Every year they are they are um, organizing uh, Women's Week and inviting international women to participate with uh, Palestinian women. And this year our the, the theme was transforming pain into a constructive power. You know, because our pain, our frustration is a power. That's why we need to channel that pain constructively. We have different kinds of groups who are coming to visit the farm, including Israeli groups staying there. And the idea is, it is, as I said before, it's an eye-opening experience. We will be facing very difficult situation very soon after the wall is, uh, is finished. Um, and that's why we wanted, uh, we will be living there as uh, on a project like an island, to totally isolated from the villages and from the city. That's why we are trying to make this farm self-sufficient. So we invested in, in the energy, so we have uh, a solar power system. We, we are trying to develop, uh, to have like a wind turbine, a small one. And it is also educational, because we need, we want to educate people about alternative energy. We want to bring children and young people to the farm and show them how this functions. And it will, be, it will open uh, an opportunity for them. So we invested also in, in water, so we built systems, and we hope and pray for rain, because in the last years it didn't rain much. Uh, we are trying also to increase the, the production of the farm, to make it self-sufficient, but also to, make, to open a market for our products, uh, especially for the guest groups who are coming to visit our farm. So we're trying to, to make this story well-known abroad, in order to, to have more guests coming to visit our farm and learn about us and learn that there is hope for that area of the world. Uh, last year we had uh, 4,000 guests and now until today we had about 4,200 people from different countries they came to visit, including people from Israel. This is actually through, uh, through the, um, the connections we are trying to build uh, you know, uh, internationally and also locally and with other Israeli organizations. We have a vision for the future. We, we, we are not like just acting day by day. We are trying to achieve our vision. Uh, sometimes like people, they think uh, how you think in this way in a very difficult situation, which is also limited for you. Of course, it's difficult for us, but we need, you know, despite of that, we need to focus to look forward. And that's why we are trying to achieve a community center in the village. And we started with a sustainable farming school. And on the long run, we would like to achieve a vocational training center for young people to come and educate them and also, you know, educate them about uh, peace building and justice. And on the long run, we are looking forward to have a peace center and a peace village. Of course, those kinds of things, we need a building permit and we will never get them from the Israelis, but why not to start thinking this way in a step by step? I always uh, believe in small steps, and I do whatever we I can. You have to do whatever you can, 
And all these, those steps together, combined together, will definitely um, change the face of the world. We have even, we, we did a plan for the whole area, how it would look like maybe in, in 15 to 20 years. I mean, this is, this is important to think in this way, but also we have to be realistic. We have to go in a step by step. Um, even if we fall down, we try to, to stand up again and continue. More, uh, we have, we will, in, we try, you know, we hope to invite you. You are invited to be part of this dream. Uh, of course, as I said before, we are not asking people to be on one side of the story because every story has more sides. But the idea is we want to, to, uh, to give you an idea how we live there, but also not in a negative way, but also to, to try to tell you that there is uh, a hope for a better future and focus on, the, on, on this hope. And this is what we are trying to ask you to be uh, part of this dream and this vision. We, uh, you can find more information about the work we are doing under tentofnations.org or under uh, um, photona.org. We have uh, Friends of Tent of Nations North America. Um, uh, Kay Plitt is presenting our organization here. And uh, you can find more information in the brochures. Um, we started with zero or below zero, and we achieved a lot there. And um, in a step-by-step -step process, what we are not able to achieve, we try to invest in the new generations, because at the end, they will continue the work. This is my son, Bishara, on a tractor. And Bishara means the good news. So remember that Palestine has also good news. Thank you. And before we do questions and answers, we do have brochures. You can take one or five. <laughs> there are lots of them there. <laughs> Spread them around. And a sign-in sheet there for us. Um, if you're interested in getting an update on what's happening on the farm, what's happening with the fundraising, uh, we send about four or five newsletters a year, either by mail, if we have a mailing address, or by email, preferably. So sign up if you'd like to get some information along the road from us. And uh, we're really glad that you uh, have come and share this with the friends who didn't make it here today, Eric. And what I want to say, too, is you young people are given a chance to know a lot more about what's happening on the land than I ever did at, my, at your age. And I'm, I'm a late bloomer in all of this. So take advantage of this bit of knowledge and do your own research and your reading and get a broad spectrum beyond what our media gives you. Because there's lots of stuff out there that we don't see in our newspapers. And just before as well, um, I believe there's also a sign-up sheet for uh, Central New York working for a just peace in Israel and Palestine, and a lot of the, the things that go through that list are, are actually things that are related to our Middle East Studies program here. I encourage you all to sign up for that to learn about what's going on. Um, and for those of you who have friends who couldn't make it to this lecture, Dawood is also speaking tonight um, at 7 p.m., uh, I think that, that went through the listserv as well. University United Methodist Church, which is 1085 East Genesee Street. So encourage your friends to come listen, or if you missed some of the talk today, please join us tonight. I'll add one more thing again. <laughs> if anybody's interested in possibly getting information about joining an IFPB tour, I do have some brochures and flyers out here about their scheduled events and about them, so I can pick these up for me. Now I'm through. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Any questions, Yuna? I actually have a question because I have a, um, a colleague who's a Palestinian American doing his PhD and he's researching uh, some of the pressures coming from Israeli, I don't know if it, whether it's coming from the Israeli government, let's just say Israeli state, whether it's business or, um, uh, or more political. Um, regarding this whole notion of uncultivated land. Um, and his argument is that well, actually a lot of the land is very well cultivated. It's just cultivated using a different logic. That's one that's long-term. It's sustainable. And so the, the land's not being over-farmed in the way that it does in many other, you know, like, over... Um, exhausted capitalist sort of systems. And so his whole argument is that, well, actually, you know, they're pressuring people to over farm their lands to such a degree that they're not going to, it's not sustainable. There's not enough water, there's not enough minerals, there's not enough anything. And so I was wondering whether or not you face those kind of pressures, whether there's a certain degree you have to reach where, where your farm is considered um, productive and whether or not these are boundaries that we could sort of shift when we're thinking about long-term sustainability. Of course.
course, you know, the, uh, the idea of like declaring land as a state land is has, you know, this has uh, to do with politics. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was, there was a law during the Ottoman period. If you don't use your land, which is not registered, so if you have your paper for the land, it's yours. You know, you do whatever you want. But for the land that is not registered, so and it's not being used, uh, so the state has the right to declare it as a state land. And this, the Israelis after 1967, they apply this law. You know, and of course they are not asking if you leave it for one year or two years, because many of the Palestinians are depending on so on rain. Mm. You know, some years it, it didn't rain much, so how can we plant? Uh, crops, you know, it won't work. Uh, some people they uh, they are not working with heavy machines because it's like another way of farming back home, sustainable farming, mm -hmm. which is using horses, you know, uh, to plow the fields. But this is they are not using this this issue. They say they take aerial photographs, you know, and sometimes they are doing it before, let us say, in September, in September or uh, you know, late 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 September. When the land is not cultivated, and they take an aerial photograph and say, look, the, your land is not cultivated. But th this is what happened with our case, with our situation. They showed me, when we went, we had to go to the court, they showed me an aerial photograph and said, look, your land is not cultivated here. And then I asked when it was taken, this picture. He didn't want to tell me, you know. But at the end, he said, it's in September. He said, of course, in September we are not plowing, because the first plowing will be in October after the first rain. Could be like after you know, in November. Now until now we didn't cultivate there because it still did not rain. You know, so they are using it for political purposes, and this has nothing to do with sustainability. You know, just only you know it's politics in order to take land and declare it as a state land for the uh, for the settlements. You know, it's mostly politics. You know. So is the only way to fight that then just by you know. Um making that, annulling that law, like making it so that it's not operable? Because the, the issue is uh, always show presence on the land. This is what we are trying to do. You know, always we are present there, you know. And any time they come, they, they find people. And of course we try, you know, there are also pieces of land you cannot cultivate. It's rocky, it's uh, steep. Uh, but the idea is like we try to make always some changes there. Like build a stone wall, put a fence, you know, to show that people are, are working there, you know. But it is not just a uh, thing to do for, from their side, because even if it's like my private land, I don't want to cultivate it. I want to, to use it for, you know, like uh, for the sheep or for the goats. I have the right to, to, to do it by myself. But the idea is uh, they are doing that in order just to take land. Yes, please. I'm sorry I missed your first part of your lecture, but um, I was just wondering if you have any contacts or if you have joint projects with other uh, Palestinian organizations, because I've been in the area, so I'm kind of familiar with their work, and I was wondering if you, if yeah, you of work course. with them, we, yeah. and if so, which ones? No, we have, uh, we have different kinds of activities, like with, uh, with peace organizations in the Bethlehem area, they come and use our place, you know. Um, for meetings, for gatherings. We have also on the other side, we have uh, not only with the Palestinian, we have also uh, contacts with Israeli organizations who come also to our, to our farm. You know. The idea is like we want to open this place for people to come and specifically we are, not, we are not asking to be in charge of the program. Sometimes we organize our own programs and invite people, but sometimes people, they ask us and say we, we want to have a seminar there. We, have to, we, need, we want to make a workshop. Can we use uh, your area? And they are welcome to do that. Uh, do you and your family live right on that land, or do you live nearby? Or no, no we, we are the only family who live on the farm. Yes. So we, of course, you know, we are connected with Bethlehem. The children are going to school there, but we are living on the farm. I have a question. Um, when it comes to the legal process, um, can you like give again a summary of what is the status of your case right now? Like what's against and what's playing against you? What's playing with you? Yes. 
I mean, uh, this, the, the, uh, the legal battle stopped in 1991, and the argument is that uh, the land has no owner. It's a state land. So we went to the court and we presented the papers. Of course, the, the Israeli military judge was shocked to see papers, was not expecting us to have papers. The case was postponed because they did not have a case. But they, are, they were trying to find a way, you know, legal way to take it. Then they said, well, we don't know if the, if the papers you have are for the right place. You know? So we have to prove that our papers are the right ones. Then they said to us, you need to survey the land again. We have an old map for the land. And we, another survey, uh, we had to pay for that and order. And in order to be recognized, we should... Uh, uh, find, you know, we should uh, find our neighbors to sign on our map, you know, to prove our borders. We did it now for the tenth time. The last time we had to do it, uh, we had to hire an Israeli land surveyor because they said the Palestinian land surveyors are not recognized in Israel. So they have uh, to have an Israeli. Okay, we, we found one through our lawyer. And he had to go to Istanbul and he had to go to, uh, to England, you know, to London to check the, the old papers because we had papers from the Ottomans and the English mandate period and then come back and write a report. We had to pay for him $70,000 you know, for that. Now the case was postponed legally, case postponed, postponed and postponed. And uh, later, a uh, couple of years back, five years back, we received a paper from the court says, well, uh, we are in the process of recognizing you as the owner. But you need to survey the land again now and then apply for a registration papers from the Israeli authorities. He said, okay, we'll do it the legal way, you know. Whatever they ask us, we did. And until now, we are waiting. We did, it, uh, we did the survey and uh, we are uh, waiting for answers. We fulfilled everything they asked us to do, but still postponement. On the ground, they try, of course, you know, to isolate us. You know, so the case is, is in court, in the court, but on the ground they are trying now to build roads that connect settlements together. And at the end, we will find ourselves in a, uh, you know, in a ring of Israeli settlements or settlers' roads, and we will not have an access to our farm. And they might come and say, well, this is your farm, but you have no access to it. Yeah. So that's why we are trying, of course, we, have for, we hope for the best, but we are trying to, uh, to be realistic and try our, to prepare ourselves for the worst. That's why we are trying to make the project also self-sufficient in order to exist there even if we, are, if we will be disconnected from the city and the villages. You know? But legally, we are still in court until today. Always postponement. And you never know what might happen tomorrow. Now, in the slide, you've seen some small structures. They've been there long enough that that's not part of the demolishing order. They, they are not new structures, and so the, the housing, the small things that you saw are not. But the, the roof extension for shade is without permit. Um, the and, tents. Uh, the tents, even though they take them down during the winter, they're only up for the summer months because of, of housing. Um, and the Trinity Presbyterian Church helped sponsor the replacement of the covering for those. So I said, look, tell them that this is, this, owned, this is owned by the Presbyterian Church in Arlington, Virginia. They have no right to take down our tents. I don't think that would fly if they ever came onto the ground. But it's uh, maybe a little bit more about those demolishing orders and the demolition orders and how, we, how you stop that again and again. Yes, we received uh, last May uh, nine demolishing orders for uh, those structures you mentioned on the farm, the tents. And even you know, you're not allowed to have a tent. And the idea is the message is clear. We don't want you to be there. And uh, what we, we, we try to do is uh, we, we went to the court, to the, to the Supreme Court. And through the pressure that came also from outside, we, many friends of us, they acted and they started sending letters and writing emails to their governments, to their representative offices, to the Israeli embassies. And because of that pressure, we, uh, we managed to, to freeze the demolishing orders. Now uh, the Israeli authorities were given at the beginning 60 days to react, to write the reasons why they want to demolish our structures. And uh, it was, uh, they, they were given time uh, until the 3rd of August. Then they said, well, we did not have enough time to study this case. And then the Supreme Court gave them another 60 days. 
uh, until the 3rd of October. And again, they said we, we need more time. And now they got also another time until the 3rd of January, you know, always postponing and postponing. And of course, for us, uh, you know, it is raising the, um, let us say, the, the financial burden uh, because we have to, to pay for, for lawyers, for land uh, experts and so on. But on the other hand, we, are, uh, we said we will never give up because we are, like, we are uh, defending our home. You know? And this is very important for us. We are going forward and forward without uh, getting tired, you know, let us say. Please. Um, <clears throat> I have a seven-year-old son who rebels against my sort of political sensibility and my wanting to live in ways that conserve resources and whatnot. And I wonder how, uh, talk a little more about your children and how old they are and that process of them. It's, you know, it's, it's one thing for us as adults to choose to um, challenge authority, to take positions, to put ourselves in difficult situations. It's sometimes harder to figure out how to do that in terms of our children. Um, so. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult because the children, I can say from both sides, they are growing up in a very difficult situation. And even children, they don't, they don't uh, live their childhood, like playing, you know, they are, they are facing difficulties. And every day, like you going to the school, you face a checkpoint. So the children ask why they are controlling us. When we, when we cross from, from the farm to Bethlehem and uh, back, then they, the roadblock, why they are closing. And sometimes they are, we are stopped by Israeli military. And then the children, they raise these questions. Now, uh, we, I'm trying, you know, to, um, with my children, is to avoid talking about the political situation. Not because uh, I don't want them to learn about it, because they see it on the ground. But I want to channel their frustration constructively. So we focus on the positives, what we are doing there, you know, what we are building there. And um, I was on a speaking tour in Germany last September, and uh, my son, uh, Bishara, he became, he became six years old on the 20th of September. I was, I was not at home, you know. And he, I phoned him to, to, to tell him happy birthday and so on. And he told me, where are you? I said, well, I'm, 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 I'm in, in, Ger in, in Germany. And he said to me, Why, what are you doing in Germany? We have a lot of work on the farm. <laughs> Come and, and help us. <laughs> so uh, this is, this is the, the idea, you know, to, to let them focus on, on, on positive things. But sometimes, like, um, we are facing difficulties. One time I tell you the story and also to tell you how we acted differently. One time I was crossing from the farm to Bethlehem. Uh, it was 11 o'clock in the evening and my, my wife and children, three children, were inside the car with my mom and... Suddenly, uh, from the fields, uh, six, seven soldiers were jumped in front of the car, carrying heavy guns. You know, they are, uh, uh, you know, um, what you call it? Uh, yes, with... Uh, um, and at, at the end, you know, they stopped in front of the car, and they, uh, they were screaming. I had to, to switch off the car and, um, and to move out, like making like this, walking. And I had to do it. Uh, they were terrified too, you know. I, you know, of course, we, it was a fearful situation for us, but for both sides, you know. And then they took my ID cards and the card, and they said to me, "We need to 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 look inside the car, your car." And I said to them, "My children are sleeping in the car, and if I wake them up, they will be terrified to see you like this." They said, "This is the orders. You have to follow the orders." So they followed me to the car. And I went into the car and I started to wake my children up. But I was talking to them in English in order I wanted the soldier to understand what's going on. So I told my children, wake up. You, uh, don't be afraid. You will see Israeli soldiers carrying guns, but they are friendly people. Don't be afraid. So I woke them up, went out of the car, waited until, um, until they, they you know, looked in the car. And then half an hour later, he called me to give me my ID card back. And he said to me, the officer told me, please apologize to your family. We did something wrong. You know? And this is, of course, you know, it was like a bad situation for us. But we, son we send those people with a message back home, you know. And this is also the, the power of, uh, let us say, of non-violent actions. You know? 
And we try also to raise up our children this way. So. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to listen to me. And I hope that I try to give a message and we wanted to welcome you anytime to visit our farm there. Thank you so much.